Philippians 2, 1 through 14. All right, here we go. Y'all ready? Philippians 2, starting in verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Some translations also say that he did not consider it something to be grasped to. In other words, to be held on to at all costs. But instead, what he did was he made himself of no reputation and he took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that if the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just ask, Lord God, that you'd be with us this morning. Lord, we lift up the children to you and pray that you'd give them hearts, Lord that would be receptive to the seed of your gospel, that you'd fill up the teacher with your word, Lord, and that you'd use them as a vessel through which you would speak your truth. And Lord, I pray for us in here this morning and that you'd use me as a vessel. We know that you, Holy Spirit, are the one that we need to hear from. We don't need to hear from a man, even though you've chosen the foolishness of preaching to confound the wise and you've chosen to use marred clay, Lord, to speak forth your eternal gospel, Lord. Lord, we pray that you would be the one that shows up and that you'd speak forth with your word, with your anointing, Lord, that you'd reach deep inside each and every one of our hearts, Lord, that you'd reveal your truth. Lord, remove the spiritual cataracts or whatever it is that causes blindness to us in the spirit realm that we can't see your word for our own lives, Lord God. And Lord, allow us not to think that it's our neighbor next to us, but that it's us that you're speaking to, Lord. Lord, we all need your help. Lord, we all need your grace. We need you to speak your truth to our hearts. Lord, give us revelation this morning. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, I titled my message this morning, Bright Stars in a Black Sky. This, this particular letter, the Philippian, the letter to the Philippian church, and I mean, I'm not going to sit here. I'm not going to get up there and draw the map for you. But this church was one of the ones that was in that area of Asia Minor. Uh, of one of the several churches that Paul helped to plant in that area. And this letter is considered one of the prison epistles. An epistle, once again, is a word, another word for a letter. And it was one of the ones that was written while the Apostle Paul was in prison. Philemon, Colossians, Philippians were, were the other, uh, Ephesians, I think I mentioned all of those, were, were the ones where Paul wrote this first time that he was imprisoned in Rome. Now, he was imprisoned the second time when he wrote 2 Timothy, but in that pr- imprisonment, that's the one before he died, where he wrote to Timothy and he said, bring the cloak, bring the, the letter, the parchments, the scrolls, because he was in a different type of prison situation. He was in a prison that you can still go visit in Rome today called the Mamertine Prison. It was a dungeon, it was a hole, it was cold, it was damp, it was dark, and that was different. That was before he got his head cut off by Nero 
for preaching the gospel, but this time he was imprisoned in Rome. It was a little bit different. He was allowed visitors. He had a little bit of freedom. He was still considered locked up or chained. Um, in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, it explains a little bit about this imprisonment. It says, But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds or my chains in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident or growing in confidence by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So what we see from this letter is he tells them that he's that he's in prison and that, you know, they probably were kind of feeling sorry for him and maybe pitying him a little bit because, you know, man, the poor apostle, he he's over here and he's locked up and he and he can't move around with freedom. But he heard news that maybe people were feeling that way. But he said, no, you need to understand something. Because of the fact that I'm locked up, because of the position that I am, what I'm starting to realize is that the gospel is being furthered. It's being furthered in a place right now where if I weren't here, it could have never been furthered before. He said that because of my bonds, the word of God is going forth even in the midst of the palace. Now, the word for palace there is praetorium, and it described a place where the Roman soldiers actually lived in Rome. They lived in a certain area of barracks. And and if you read in Acts chapter, well, you can actually turn there, Acts 28.30. I just want to show you a little bit of the history of the Apostle Paul. Some of you may not have known this, but when he was in prison this first time that we're talking about, it says, Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hard house and received all that came in unto him. What that means is, is that the Apostle Paul, when he was imprisoned in Rome this first time, was allowed to rent his own dwelling. And he stayed in, in prison in that sense for two years. But it wasn't like, and he was allowed to have visitors, but the whole time he was chained to a guard. So if you could imagine, this house that he was renting was near the barracks of this praetorium where these Roman soldiers lived. And 24 7, the Apostle Paul was chained at the wrist to a Roman guard. Now, if you've ever experienced being around someone that was on fire for Jesus and that was willing to speak publicly for the Lord under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, then you've noticed that sometimes whenever a crowd begins to gather that they get a little bit more excited and they speak even a little bit more loudly because they know that now there's other ears that are around to hear the truth. Now, if you can imagine, if you've ever experienced that for yourself, the Apostle Paul now, each day, every shift, changing out guards, Visitors coming to visit the Apostle Paul. And here they are, these soldiers chained to him. And he begins to have these conversations. And every single time, I can assure you, these conversations lead to the message of salvation. Lead to the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified. And these soldiers are hearing it. And he's saying that the furtherance of the gospel is going forward even with all, all the palace. He's hearing that the after effects of it, whenever these soldiers are unchaining themselves and going back to the barracks, is that they're also talking because they knew why he was in prison. He was in prison not because he did something wrong on the street like that maybe, maybe some of us might have done in our past life. But instead, he was going against what the Roman culture would have said that the emperor was deity. And instead, he was saying, no, there is a God. His name is Jesus. And he died on the cross and he rose from the dead and he's come to give you new life. And in this situation, he's encouraging them and he's letting them know that, listen, you don't have to feel sorry for me. This is God's will for my life. And based on the content of chapter two, it appears that many in the church weren't really getting along very well. See, one of, we know from, from internal evidences of other books... <coughs> and letters that there was a pastor of Ephesus. His name was Epaphroditus. And he went and spoke to Paul during this two years. And it appears that through his conversation, he explained to the apostle that there was a lot of bickering going on in the middle of the church. People weren't really getting along well. There was a lot of chaos, confusion, disunity, people talking behind other people's backs, just various things like that. And so... It seems as though that the Apostle Paul wants to address this. It doesn't seem. That's exactly what he's doing. If you look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, he explains this in the beginning of chapter 2. 
He says, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, what he in the King James, when it talks about bowels, it's talking about deep-seated emotions. Something that's way deep down on the inside. And, and, he's, and he's saying that if, that if any of these things exist, fulfill ye my joy that you would be like minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound a whole lot like the world today. It doesn't sound a whole lot sometimes like the church today. Right. You know, the reality of it is, is that most times we're so worried about making sure we get what we got coming to us that we don't really worry a whole lot about our brother or our sister on the side of us. Sometimes we don't worry too much about really our decisions or the words that we speak and how they're going to affect other people. But he used three words and I use three C's in this little passage right here consolation comfort and communion he says he uses the word consolation if there be any consolation in christ you know the word some of you may have heard of this before in the greek the word parakletos it's a word for the comforter it's a word that's used and describes the holy spirit i'm not trying to get all technical on you but para is a is a preposition and it means on the side of klesis or kletos means to call the idea when it's speaking of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit was called to come alongside you and I to comfort us, to help us in this walk. Because you can't do it on your own. Amen. 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 You need to help. Uh, and so this word, though, is describing it more as like an adverb. It's a, oh, it's a para, paraclesis. It's, it's comfort <laughs> in, in your time of need. Just as the, it's, it's the effect of the Holy Spirit in your life. Because, because of the fact that you've been connected to the Holy Spirit through Jesus, you have access to be comforted and to be consoled. And so he's saying, if there's any consolation in Christ, if there's any comfort, I don't know about it. He, he's trying to say, have you, have, do you remember when you experienced what you were like before you got a hold of Jesus and the result of it after you got a hold of Jesus and how the Holy Spirit now has ministered to your life and how he strengthened you and comforted you in your time of need Whenever you've experienced those th those things that you needed from God and he showed up for you. Have you have you experienced that before? If there's any of that that has ever taken place in your life, if there's any fellowship of the spirit, that's why I, word, I use the word communion there. I know I've shared this word in the Greek, but the Greek word there is koinonia and usually it's translated as communion. I mean, he's saying fellowship. You know what the word really means in the Greek is joint participation. I love that idea. Think about that. Joint participation with the Holy Spirit. If there's any joint participation with the Holy Spirit, we can just preach on that all Amen. morning long. In other words, what the Holy Spirit is what the Holy Spirit through Paul is saying is that if indeed you have been called close to the Lord, if indeed you have received comfort from God in your time of need, if indeed you're willing to joint participate with the Holy Spirit because he's speaking something to your heart. Amen. If you have been saved from the dead and the Holy Spirit lives in your heart, he's speaking something to your heart. And the message that he speaks to you is altogether different than the message that is being propagated by the world. Amen. And so if this is the case, will you joint participate with the Lord as he speaks to you and talks to you about a life of sacrifice that is incumbent or expected in the life of the believer. If indeed you are willing to join participate, then there's some things that you should realize. Number one, you shouldn't handle your business through strife. See what he said right there? He said, if you go back to that verse, he says, He said right there, he says, don't do anything through strife or vain glory. The word strife means electioneering or divisions. So it'd be kind of like if I went up to old Curtis and I was like, hey, man, I don't know about you, but I don't really like the way that old girl is handling stuff in the nursery or I don't like the way or if we're on the job. 
you know, and, and I pull somebody off to the side. I don't know about you, but the decision old boy made, man, that's just not working for me. How you feel about all of that? So I like kind of like pulling people off to the side, causing a little bit of division, right? He says that, not, that it should not result in, in, in strife or, uh, or divisions, or pride, I'm sorry. Don't don't go through don't don't allow this strife to take place or pride or vainglory. And then the idea is empty pride. So you're so puffed up in yourself and you think that you have your own rights to the point where you're not concerned about how your other people are treated. Instead, you should be of a humble heart. And you can't, and the last thing is, is that if there is truly joint participation with the Holy Spirit in this passage, what I'm trying to say is that you can't just do whatever you want without considering how it will affect your brother in the Lord. That's what he was saying. You got to think of the lives of other people and how it will affect them. You know, I don't want to spend too much time just on this because this is just the introduction. But I just want to say that sometimes we don't think about that. We get so consumed when we feel like we're wrong. That we don't think about how the Holy Spirit would have us to handle and to respond. That's good. I mean, we, we sometimes we just got to be reminded of the same old thing time and again. Sometimes people are like, man, you, preacher, you preach the same thing every time. That's because God says the That's same right. thing every Amen. time. And why does he say the same thing every time? Because people are hard-headed and stiff-necked and stubborn and rebellious. Amen. And even though he's been saying it for thousands of years, nobody really submits to it and does it. So until you get the willingness to soften your neck and soften your head and allow the Holy Spirit to deal with your heart, your mind, and the way that you respond, the same message will be regurgitated time and again because God continues to speak the same thing. Maybe regurgitation is a bad word about the world. <laughs> Cut that out. People won't like that. I don't like that. Right? Because the word of God is beautiful. Amen. And it speaks to our hearts and it wants to bring us hope. So this is point number one. Think like he thought. In Philippians 2, verse 5, the apostle Paul said this. He said, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Think like he thought. Look at Romans 12 too. <clears throat> it says, be not conformed to this world. I want you to know that I just remember I didn't really do a whole lot of study, but I've taught this, so, this passage so many times. I remember that that word conformed means to be molded from an external source. It's kind of like a potter with clay, right? But the idea here is, is that it's not like God's the potter and you're the clay. In this situation, the world is the potter and you're the clay. Don't allow the world to be your potter. Don't allow the message of the world to conform you into its own image. But instead, what should be happening here is that you should be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, the word transformed there is metamorphosis. It's where we get the word metamorphosis. Y'all remember what y'all learned about metamorphosis back in junior high or high school, right? About a little caterpillar. How the caterpillar would put himself in a cocoon and he was like this little grub worm at one time. And then lo and behold, when he broke forth from the cocoon, he had wings and he could fly. And he was this beautiful creature. And he was so different than what he used to be, right? That what the gospel is saying right here, a similar illustration, is that before when you were born of Adam, you were born a sinner, Come on, somebody, help me out here. We were all born in the same boat. Some people have also complained, oh, the preacher talks too much about sin. Listen, ain't nobody poking you in the eyeball. The, the preacher was born a sinner just like we're all in the same boat. That's why God had to bankrupt heaven and send his only begotten precious son who had no sin to bear the burden on Calvary, to pay the burden of your sin upon his back so that you could be metamorphosed. Meta, receive metamorphosis so that you could go from being that little worm to a butterfly. If you would allow joint participation with the Holy Spirit to work in your life, the Holy Spirit will change you. He'll change the way you think. He'll change the way you act. He will change everything about you. Hallelujah. Amen. Don't be conformed by this world. Don't let the message of the world help me out. Listen to me. You're going to be exposed to this message everywhere you turn around. You'll hear it when you go into Walmart. You'll hear it if you don't tune your radio right. You'll hear it if you hang out with certain types of people. You'll hear it at work. Sometimes you can get away with it, away from it. Sometimes you can't get away from it. 
There's some places I, you can't get away from it. And it will try to affect you and it will try to inundate you and it will try to mold you like a potter molds its clay. But the word transformation, it describes, yes, metamorphosis. But the interesting thing about it is, is that within that caterpillar was the DNA to be a butterfly. That's really the meaning of this word in the Greek language. Something on the inside is there and it begins to manifest outwardly. See, that's the difference. The word metamorphosis right here, as it speaks in Romans chapter 12, too, is that there's something on the inside of you now. There's a seed of the gospel planted, a seed. Jesus, the presence of the Holy Spirit now dwells on the inside of you. And that which is in you wants to come out and be manifest to the world around you. Yes. Think like Jesus thought. Don't be conformed or molded to this world from an external source, but instead let the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit transform you for, through the renewing of your mind. Amen. Listen to me. The one thing that the Christian needs to go, I used to love this about Brother Larson, what he'd say. We need to, when I first started listening to him on the radio, Christians need to be thinkers. Hello. We need to just quit listening to what everybody else tells us. Quit listening to what every preacher behind every pulpit says because sometimes they ain't telling us the truth. When the truth of the gospel is spoken, it will begin to tell you, hallelujah, that you look different on the inside, amen, and that we need to begin to think like that. The new man in Christ. The old man born of Adam, born in sin, has died. He's been buried. He's been wrapped up like a tomb in a cocoon. And a new man, hallelujah, is being energized by the Holy Spirit, given new life. Amen. And he ought to start looking different on the outside. Somebody help me because I'm preaching better. Amen. And you're amen. And why? Because the truth of the gospel is telling us that we need to not be conformed by the world, but instead we need to be transformed. See, the world has a certain way of thinking. In a certain way of handling their business. The world operates in a way where it looks out for itself, but it requires faith to operate like Jesus. You know that? You believe that? Listen, man, we can put on our church clothes and we can put on whatever. And we can put on our church face and we can show up to church. And then if we live Monday through Saturday completely different than when we show up on Sunday, then we're not really letting the gospel affect us. That's right. The gospel will work in your real world, where you live, where you're touched. Amen? And listen, the world handles their business a certain way. And when you hand you your business the way he did, listen to me, there's a good chance that people might try to take advantage of you. Because he was humble and he was lowly. Right? And you may not get what you think is rightfully yours right away. I'm not going to sit here and give you a whole bunch of personal examples because I probably talked a little bit too much about myself to begin with. But all of us have Christians as Christians have faced situations and circumstances where we didn't necessarily get what we thought we had coming to us right when we expected to get it. Listen, I get it. If you're a good. I'm just talking about the workplace right now. If you're if you have good work ethic, then you know what you do. You get up. And you go to work. <laughs> you get up and you go to work and you give an honest day's work for an honest day's wage. Right. You made an agreement with your employer. I mean, look, then we maybe go to the parable about how some was hired in the morning and some in the afternoon and then some at the end of the day. And then the ones whenever they settled accounts all got the same thing. And then the ones that were hired in the morning, well, that ain't fair. I mean, we've been working all day long and they just came at the last. You don't tell the master how much he's going to pay, who he's going to pay. You don't tell the boss. No, you agreed to work. Now, if you're going to let the devil come into your head and your heart and start to and start to mess with you, maybe God allows things like that to happen to us on purpose That's right. to see how we're going to respond. Yes. That's the point that I'm trying to make. You can respond in the flesh like the world, or you can allow yourself to be humble. That's what the Apostle Paul said in this passage. He said, don't do things through strife and vainglory. Elevating self, allowing pride to take over. Listen, there comes a time that the Lord may release you if the people are treating you improperly, but don't think that God won't allow certain things to happen in your life to humble you, to see how you're going to respond. Oh, so you didn't get your way right away when you wanted to get it, when you thought this, you thought this was Burger King or something? No, you don't always get your way. And God is allowing these things to happen in our lives to test us in a moment. Listen, this is the question that I would ask regarding this concept. Is God big enough? Mm 
to turn it around. Amen. 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 Is God big enough if you're willing? See, because what I'm talking about is the world don't operate that way. The world says, I got what I got coming to me. I put in this and I demand to get this. Well, good, then you might have to pack your bags and you might have to go down the road. But don't be surprised if you hadn't packed your bag five different times in the last two years. And at some point in time, you got to start wondering whose fault is it? Really? You see what I'm saying? Have you ever learned the situation that the Lord was trying to teach you? The same thing goes with churches. You can pack your bags and go to another church. You can pick up your toys and go play in another sandbox. And, 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 but the reality of it is, is, is that after you've done that four or five times because the preacher doesn't say what it is that you wanted him to say, at some point in time, whose fault was it? Is it because we refuse to receive correction from the word of the Lord? I mean, I'm just saying, is it possible? Jesus didn't handle his business that way. No, what he did was he humbled himself. See, that's what the scripture says, that he humbled himself in verse 8, and he became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Think like he thought. How did he think? The Bible says that though he was in the form God, Oh, I'm not, we don't have time to really break it down in the Greek, but I'm just here to tell you that Jesus was the pre-incarnate word that spoke the worlds into existence. Jesus is what was deity. Jesus is deity. Jesus has always been deity. And he was the word that spoke the world into existence. But then and he considered it not robbery to be equal with God, but he didn't consider it something to be grasped to. But instead, Jesus, while he was always God and always will God, understood his part in the God ahead. I'm sorry if you got a problem with that. The Bible says that there's coming a day whenever Jesus is going to be all finished with his business. And what he's going to do is he's going to turn the kingdom back over to the Father. That's what the Bible says. So that means that in his place in the Godhead, Jesus submits himself to the will of the Father. And what Jesus did was is that he allowed himself to be humbled to the point where he took upon himself human flesh so that he could humble himself to the point to become a servant. The word is doulos. It means a slave. Jesus humbled himself so that he could serve the Father. See, the reality of it is, is this, and I've just got this concept of work on my mind right now, is that you're working for somebody bigger than your boss. you got to understand that. Amen. You're living in the midst of a perverse and a crooked world Amen. that says that, every, that they can do whatever it is that they want to do, but the reality of it is, is this, is that your boss might do you wrong, but if the Lord puts you in that spot, you got a bigger voice to answer to than the boss that you Praise see in the God. physical. Amen. You're a child of the living king. Amen. And whenever the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, he's telling you how to conduct your business. And, and he wants you to handle your business a certain way. Jesus humbled himself and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Question that I was asking is, can you have faith and trust him that if you handle yourself the way God is asking you to, that he is big enough to take care of you and promote you when he's ready? Dude, that goes for so many different things in our lives. Is he big enough to do what it is that, that you need him to do in your life? If you will trust him, in other words, not take matters in your own hands, not try to let your arm outreach his arm, not try to, in your own wisdom, in your own plans, make things happen for your life, whether it be job, whether it be relationships, whether it be finances, whatever it might be that you're facing. Can you trust God and humble yourself enough to believe that he is able to get you out of the situation if you will do it? The way that he's asking you to do it. Listen to me. In verse 9 he said this. Because Jesus humbled himself. Because Jesus did what the father wanted. Because of that. He, God has also highly exalted him. The main thing is this. is that, you know, in, the, in the plan of God. You know, we're talking about the difference between spiritual things. But also how they affect our practical lives. When I'm talking about Jesus lowering himself and humbling himself, but the Apostle Paul said this, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And, and, and because of his willingness to humble himself, he's been exalted to the right hand of the Father. Hmm. Principalities and all powers, fallen angels, demons, spirits, they bow in his presence. They will bow. Amen. Every, every leader that's ever, faith, that's ever been on the face of the earth as pompous and as awesome as he thought he was, he will bow. 
Because every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And you're either going to confess and bow now or you're going to do it one day in judgment. But if you can trust him and handle yourself in a way that brings God glory, he can trust you and he will be willing to promote you. God can promote you, folks. Amen. Amen. Jesus was more concerned about what the Father wanted than who he was concerned about what was rightfully his. It was rightfully his to be deity. That's who he is. But he humbled himself. He died so we could have life. And because of that, look at this. This is so good. We have access to grace so that we can die to self. That's really the gospel. The gospel is all about you and I dying to self. That's the practical aspect of the gospel in our lives. It's spiritual because we're talking about spiritual death. We're not talking about physical death. I mean, that's going to happen one day and it's going to result in the resurrection of life if we're in Christ. Amen. Amen. But upon this earth, whenever your fleshly desires try to mount themselves up, what the gospel is wanting to teach us is that, no, you got to decrease so that he can increase. Because when you continue to act and live like the world and look like the world, then guess what? You're not a star shining brightly in the midst of the darkened sky. God wants you and I to shine like stars in the midst of a darkened sky. And in order for that to happen, there's going to have to be a level of humility and submission to take place in our lives. Now, I don't know about you, and, but, but I, don't always, I don't always like the idea of humility and submission. I'm just being real with you. <laughs> I don't always like to be corrected. I'm learning better how to receive it. I just wish that I could receive, like, you know, not, like, not put, change my face so much right when it happens. You know what I'm saying? Get all twisted up in the moment. If I could do that, because I do a lot better later, you know, when I walk out. And it's like, the Lord's like, what you doing, son? You know that that was true what they said, you know? If I just wouldn't get all twisted up at first. But look what Peter said. Now you think about this. He says, 1 Peter 5, <laughs> 5 through 7. It says, likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. You ever been young before? <laughs> I tell you, have. Do you remember how you felt whenever you felt like you had to submit to somebody in authority over you? When you had that rebellious spirit in your heart? Y'all know what I'm talking about? I didn't want to listen to my principal. I didn't want to listen to my teachers. I didn't want to listen to my mama. I didn't want to listen to my daddy. I'm telling you, man, I, I probably said this before, but I remember one year I went to school. My assistant principal was Mr. Roy, and he said, come on, a Bear, let's go get it done, son. I said, what you talking about? He said, let's go ahead and get some of these licks out the way, but my arm gets tired by the time the, see, the year gets over. I'm like, man, you ain't right. But, you know, all them paddles never really affected me. It was just real quick, over with, get, get, get to go back. And then one day I remember, I don't even know why I'm saying this, but one day I remember I was playing. It was eighth grade. I was playing on the, on the, on the football team. And Mr. Oye, the, the, the main principal, he called me in his office and he goes, well, Matt, we've tried, son, every way we know how. This game that t t this afternoon, you're not playing in the game. I'm like, that was like, it was a game. Chat. You can't do that. You can't keep me out the game. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can. You're not playing in the game. dude. I just remember I cried like a little baby like that. hurt so much worse than any paddling could ever do. I just didn't want to submit to anybody. I think that's what I'm talking about right now. Submission. And the way that I f would feel, like even a, against authority and policemen, like, I, you know, I don't want to submit to nobody. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. And can you imagine, though, the, the Peter is telling them in this, submit yourselves unto the elders. So people don't like to submit themselves to any kind of authority. It's something rebellious on the inside of you. Yeah, all of you be subject one to another. That means, look. That's why I've always, listen, I know that there's supposed to be a certain level, you're supposed to honor, you know, to some extent, the, the pastor or whatever the case, because he's been called by God to, to preach the gospel. But listen, the reality of it is, is that in the kingdom, we're all That's level. right. That's right. And we're all supposed to subject ourselves one to another as brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all level at the foot of the cross. We're not, that's why I've never, listen, all this, all of, people take that stuff too far. We're all men and women that have chosen to serve the Lord and we're to subject ourselves to one another. We're supposed to humble ourselves to one another. This works real well in all kinds of relationships. Amen. It works well in marriages. It works well in friendships. It works well in relationships. And, but the problem is, is that we don't really want to submit. 
oh, well, I, just because I'm the woman, I got to submit. No, I'm not saying that. I could go to the scripture and you could see that if, if the husband would love his bride like Jesus loved the church, then there'd probably be a whole lot more submission problems. Amen. But it's not just the woman, I don't believe, that it has to submit. Because if you go back, I'm, this is not even in my notes. I'm just trying to make a point. If you go back to the Ephesians passage, it first talks about Christian brothers and sisters, again, submitting one to another. Amen? Amen. And so the reality of it is before a man and a woman are ever husband and wife, they're brother and sister in the Lord. And if you can't learn to just, I know I say this a lot, somebody got to shut up. Somebody's got to stop. I mean, have you ever been in a, in a verbal confrontation with somebody and they just will not shut up? I thank God that I'm finally learning now to where I just get tired, bro. I'm like, dude. This feels, and I know I say this a lot, but it feels like a Jerry Springer show. Do y'all not get tired? Like, I used to watch that. I'm like, how I used to watch that? Like, that is so, it wears me out. It's like they just don't stop. How they're not exhausted living like that? You know what I'm saying? Do you not get emotionally exhausted with whenever people are hollering and screaming and all that stuff? Man, I don't want that. You're not shut down. Anyway, you get my point. You're supposed to submit yourselves. And he says this, and be clothed with humility. Why? Because God resists the proud. Jesus humbled himself. We're supposed to humble ourselves. God resists the proud. But what does he do? He gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, into the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. And in the meantime, cast all your care on him because he cares for you. So you're going to go through things in this life. And the gospel's telling you, you must die to yourself and you must humble yourself. You must trust God to get you through. Amen. And in the meantime, when you're going through stuff, the enemy, you know, the word care, the word care right there is, is actually describing anxiousness, anxiety. That's what the word is. If you look it up in the Greek, it's describing anxiety. It's not that you never have a care. No, it's talking about whenever cares begin to try to overwhelm you. When the things of the world begin to try to overwhelm you and they burden you down and they start to affect you. What the gospel is saying is, is that if you will elect, throw them on him, cast, throw your cares on him because he cares for you. He cares that people don't treat you right. He cares that people don't do you right. He knows all of that stuff that's going on. And if you really belong to him and listen, you'll get victories and then the enemy will try to come back and call it. But you got to remind yourself and you got to be reminded to continue to trust the Lord and to say, hey, Lord, humble me. Help me to walk the way that you would have me to walk. Teach me your ways. Let me think like you think, Lord. Amen. 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 That was point number one. Think like he thinks. Point number two, allow the result to take place. I like this one. Allow the result to take place. Philippians 2.12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. See, some people mistake the idea of this scripture and they think it's kind of like that popular saying today, only God can judge me. So you don't worry about me. You don't worry about what I do. I'm going to work it out. Just let me and God do our thing. <laughs> but that's not what it means. That's not what it means. Because you see, well, well, I don't feel convicted. Well, guess what? Maybe your conscience is so seared, you can't, you ain't got no feeling no more. And you done, you done resisted the presence of the Holy Spirit. He's been trying to stimulate you and stimulate you. And you done let your conscience get so seared, you can't even feel it no more. So just, you can't just work and think that you, whatever is good to go is good to go. No. The idea of this is like a, is working a math problem. And coming to a result, I put the formula down right here. Y'all ready? Here we go. Sinner plus faith. That's supposed to be a plus. Plus faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. All right? You ready? Plus, well, it actually results in the indwelling. Presence of God in the believer, right? Indwelling presence of God in the believer, and this equals 
Christ likeness. This is the result. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? I know I'm kind of going overboard here. And I'm really not trying to be facetious. I'm just trying to say it's like a math problem. You come to a proper conclusion. The proper conclusion is this. Is that if indeed you were saved, the Holy Spirit has moved into your heart. Amen. If the Holy Spirit has indeed moved into your heart, that means that God lives on the inside of you. That means if God lives on the inside of you, he's telling you to handle your business the way Jesus handled his business, not the way that the world handles their business. Amen. So the ultimate result is that Christ's likeness should be coming forth. And look at this, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. What, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God? And you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now this scripture is talking, the media context is about fornication. But the big picture is that you don't belong to yourself anymore. I don't belong to myself anymore. Instead we belong to God and God lives in us, so we need to allow the result to take place. Amen. Less of you, more of him. Less pride, more humility. Less your way, more of his. Less of what you want, more of preferring your brother more than yourself. Amen. Well, I want what I got coming to me. Okay. If there's any fellowship with the Spirit, if you're working in joint participation with the Holy Spirit, you're going to quit worrying about yourself as much, and you will be able to start trusting God that if you do it his way, he will take care of you. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. Let the end result take place. All right, that was point number two. Point number three, y'all ready? Stay plugged in. <laughs> Philippians 2.13. <clears throat> For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. I like this word worketh in the Greek. This is the word right here. I like to kind of do this sometimes. But what, what y'all think? What English word do you think we make out of that? Energy. That's right. So it is God's energy, if you could say it that way. In other words, it's the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's His activity that works in you both to will and to do according to His good pleasure. So the word... The word worketh comes from the Greek energeo, which is where we get our word for energy or movement. I was asking my brother-in-law, Josh, what this guy's name is. I'm not going to say his name, but I remember one time when we had the restaurant, there was this dude that worked at the restaurant. I didn't get to see him a whole lot because he worked during the day and I was usually at work. And he was a real nice looking guy. and He was kind of a little bit different. I think they called him Biff at work because he was kind of like looked like Ken the Barbie doll. And uh, but one day I happened to be there and he was talking and he would kind of talk like a surfer dude, you know, but he said something. I was like, man, this guy's actually smart, man. He's got something knocking around in there. And I said, um, I said, dude, you got a lot of potential. He said, no, bro, I'm kinetic. And I was like, man, that was so good. I'll never forget that. That was probably 12 years ago. I said that because energy can be classified as either potential or kinetic, right? Right. And energy, so potential energy describes energy that is stored and prepared for release. Kinetic energy is energy that has been released and is in motion. Maybe a good illustration would be kind of like a bullet. The casing's filled with gunpowder. It has the potential of explosion and propulsion. And once it's ignited, the lead slug that was idle is sent into motion and now it becomes kinetic. See, this scripture describes the fact that God is the energy in our new lives. This energy immediately begins to work by changing the desires of our hearts. When we are saved, the old man that we were has died and a new man has been resurrected in Jesus Christ. It's the energy or working of the Holy Spirit that changes the desires of our heart. You can't change the desires of your heart. Only the Holy Spirit can change the desires of your heart. I, it starts to be a situation where I don't want to listen to that because it doesn't lift him up in my heart. I don't want to do that anymore because it makes me feel like I'm cheating on God. I don't want to feel that way anymore because it's against God's will. He changes desires of the heart. He's changing me. He's changing my desires. And now there's potential for right actions in that my desires are changed. Oh, no, this is good right here. You need to pay attention. Don't fall asleep right now. There's potential for there to be change 
in your life. Because he's changing the desires of your heart. But this energy of the Holy Spirit, although it's changing my desires, is also the same energy that gives me the strength to set the right action in motion. It doesn't just have to be potential. It can become kinetic. Because whenever we joint participate with the Holy Spirit and allow him to have his way in our life, we got to start making the right decisions is what it means. Yes. Right. Amen? Amen. I mean, the Holy Spirit already showed you what was right and what was wrong. Yeah. At some point in time, you got to start making the right decisions. And don't act like you can't because the reality of it is, is that you have been equipped to do such a thing. Amen. I'm telling you what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that the old man born of Adam that was bound by sin, when you put faith in Christ, that old man died. Yeah. You became one with Jesus at Calvary. You became one with him in the tomb. The old man's been buried and the new man's been resurrected to newness of life. Yeah. Hallelujah. And the same spirit that rose him from the dead will also quicken your mortal body. Yeah. If you want him to. Yes. Amen. You know, I don't, I don't know why people do it. Well, I guess it's just kind of weird and they kind of like doing that kind of thing. But I think sometimes people like to go hang out in graveyards, you know. Well, that's true. People that are in the occult and all that kind of stuff, they go yeah, hang out in the graveyards, don't they? They do. Yeah. They want to hang around with death. They like death. We're now, we've been, we've been uh, connected to life. Yeah. Amen. We've been connected to life. Yeah. So at some point in time, we got to quit wanting to hang around with death. Yeah. We got to start wanting to hang around with life. Yeah. Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit wants to change the desires of our heart, but then we got to start making the right decisions. Amen. The, 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 the devil, listen, I'm just being real with you right now. This is just the gospel, and the gospel is either right or it's not. I know that it's right. And any time that I go wrong, I know it ain't the gospel, and it's not Jesus, it's Matt. He's the problem. I'm here to tell you right now that the gospel will set you free. I'm here to tell you right now that whatever it is that ails you, whatever kind of sickness you got in your heart, your mind, your body, the Holy Spirit can heal you. And some of these things have to do with you and I allowing God to have the permission that he's desiring to work in our lives. Because we can push him off. We can barricade him and say, no, Lord, right now I'm going to hang out in the graveyard. Right now I'm going to hang out with dead stuff. Come on, that's good. Help us, Lord. Yeah. Help us to change the desires of our heart, Lord, so that we not like dead stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And then, whenever we realize we don't like dead stuff no more, give us the strength and give us revelation. That's what we need, revelation. Yes, Amen. 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 You need a revelation. I'm telling you, I know I make fun of myself all the time because I got these two veins that pop out of my forehead, but the veins ain't going to help you. <laughs> my face turned red ain't going to help you. No matter how much I holler it and scream it and try to convince you, what you need is revelation from the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about a light bulb moment. Holy Spirit, give us revelation that we no longer have to be enslaved by sin. Jesus died not just to save us so we can go to heaven, but Jesus died to break the power of sin in our lives. And when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, and when you get tired of hanging around with death in the graveyard, guess what? The Lord will open up the gate to that old graveyard, and he'll lead you right on out. And you'll just be as free. The sun will be shining on the other side of that gate. Hallelujah, no more dark rolling clouds and all this kind of misery of darkness. No, uh, you'd be like a bright star in the midst of a dark place. Hallelujah. Amen. Christianity has to go past the point of just wanting to. Amen. I want to, but I'm just in bondage. Well, you know what? At some point in time, when you get sick and tired of your bondage, you'll cry out to the Lord. And when you're desperate and you mean business, God will set you free. I promise you he will. I'm preaching to the preacher. When you get sick and tired of being sick and tired and you say, Lord, I don't know, Lord, I want to be a slave to the lies of Satan. When you cry out to the Lord, he will set you free. Amen. That's the gospel. Thank you, Jesus. It has to go past the point of just want to. Jesus died on the cross. The power of sin was broken. The power of the Holy Spirit was implanted. And now we have to work in joint participation with the Holy Spirit and say no to the sinful, lustful things the Spirit in us no longer wants. And say yes to the desires of God that have been planted inside of our hearts. Amen. Amen. That's just good right there. That's just the word. All right. Here we go. Point number four. 
Y'all ready? Yep. You're a star, so shine like one. Philippians 2, 14 through 15. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Murmurings is when you complain of something under your breath. You ever ran up on a little group of people and they were doing that? Mm -hmm. Oh, they're like, mm -hmm. belly aching and complaining about stuff. This happened in the church. This will happen at the workplace. This happened everywhere you go. Murmuring and complaining. They probably were talking about you. Hello. <laughs> if you are living for Jesus and you are taking a stand for the Lord, they probably were bad mouthing you. It ain't going to do you no good to turn around and do what they did. No, the word of God says you need to you need to jump for joy. Hallelujah. And you need to, the, the, the word of God says that when you're persecuted for the name of Jesus, that you should give glory and honor because you're going to receive a reward in heaven. If you've been strolling up through the years to take a stand for Jesus in the face of the world, don't get frustrated when they start persecuting you and leaving you out. No, what you need to do is you need to take joy in the fact that you're being persecuted. Persecuted for the name of Jesus' sake. Amen. But that's how it starts. It starts off as a murmuring and a complaining. People are over there whispering and doing all this kind of stuff. But then, look, it turns into something else. Because it goes from murmurings to disputings, which is just a straight up physical altercation of some sort. It might not be fists flying, but if nothing else, words are flying. And listen to me, whenever, whenever, and you know, the best place to talk about this is whether it's, it can happen in the church, but on the workplace, you know, uh, whenever two people that are supposed to be believers are arguing and disputing with one another in, in front of unbelievers, it causes a problem for the kingdom. Amen. Amen. And I don't always know. I remember one time, you know, and I mean, he was right. I didn't like it when he said it, but it was true. Robert came one time we were in Shoney's and me and uh, I know I've shared this before, but me and Donnie DeValcor were having a conversation. and We had disagreements about stuff having to do with the Bible. I was trying to I mean, OK, maybe Donnie will watch the video. I don't know. And. I'm not trying to say that I'm always right and that, you know, you didn't know what you were talking about. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, is that I was trying to explain my position on why I believe certain things were and why I believe certain things that he was thinking were wrong. Well, he don't like correction anymore and I like correction. And so the next thing you know, this thing's starting to escalate. And he's not scared to raise his voice, and I'm not scared to raise my voice. And the next thing you know, everybody in Shoney's is hearing the conversation. <laughs> and whenever we left, we both hugged each other, but Robert was like, yeah, but dude, we got a problem. They had like five people in there that overheard y'all. And what you gonna do? How you gonna go back and tell that guy or convince him that you're a, a, a light shining in a darkened sky? Because what you did was you was in the middle of a dispute. And you allowed all this stuff to take place out in the open of the world. They don't know you're going to go kiss and hug and make up later. They just think that y'all like y'all talking about Jesus and y'all are arguing in the middle of a public place. <laughs> Lord help us. That's how it starts though. All this under the breath murmuring and complaining. And the next thing you know, it'll turn in and because it causes tension. It causes strife. Look, man, the enemy is a master at this kind of thing. Don't think he's not. It costs two people over here to start whispering in each other's ear. It costs two people over here to start whispering in each other's ear. He'll, like, let that tension start building up. And then the next thing you know, boom, he pulls the lid off of it and everybody's fighting. <laughs> Lord, help us. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if we could just see it when it's happening. It's not that people can't have an opinion. About things, but when things are done in the wrong spirit, it results in disputes, which means outright divisions and altercations. You know, I thought it was kind of funny because during Wednesday night Bible study, if you weren't here, there was a word, um, I can't remember what the English word was, untoward. The English word was untoward, and when I looked it up in the Greek, it, it was the word scolios. And we asked everybody in the crowd, you know, what do you think English word that is? And we said scoliosis. 
Well, what do you think that it means? Crooked. Well, this time it was, I thought it was interesting, the same Greek word, but this time it was translated as crooked. It, it said it in, in, that, in that scripture that we just read, Philippians 2.14, that you might be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, this is verse 15, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked, a scoliotic and perverse nation or generation among whom you will shine as lights in the world. See, when we do this in front of the world, we look no different than them. I'm talking about when we get into disputes and we start handling our business like the world does. And it's funny to me, once again, that this word showed up and, and it talks about this world being crooked and perverse. They do stuff wrong. But when we joint participate with the Holy Spirit and allow Jesus to live his life through us, then Jesus in us becomes evident. That's what the word shine means there. It appears when light is shined, things are seen. The idea is that just as stars shine against the backdrop of darkness and are clearly visible, the light of God shines through believers against the backdrop of this crooked world and the light of God becomes evident for the world to see. Amen. Lord, Amen. allow your light 